I think I would have been here by myself. That would have been game seven. I wouldn't have blamed anybody. That would have been okay. But we're going to get started. I'm going to introduce Lynn Walsh. Is that right? Yes. And Lynn's with the Holland Center. She helps up here. So she's going to give you a little bit of background on the Holland Center. They're our host tonight. They allowed us to come in and borrow the room from them for a little bit. So Lynn, go ahead and tell everybody about the Holland Center. Okay. Uh, the Holland Center, which you're here, is a community um, resource that we try and enrich in. The community by providing educational art can you hear? Yeah. Um, for all generations. This is not just for kids or just for old people. So we have all kinds of different programs going on here. Today I was lucky enough to see, I don't know, it was like 500 little kids all excited about being in the theater. We also have a camp going on right now for sciences where kids are learning all about computers. There's a lot of adventure going on here and I think you'll all come and it, um, not only kids with this but veteran awareness has a series in the, in the winter of classes that are very enlightening about the different um, different topics. So thank you for coming. Thank you Lynn. I'll turn it over to So this all began about, well, it all began last year with the uh, fires. And right after that, we recognized the staff that we had some challenges with, I'm getting a nod, but I got to get this closer. Usually everybody can hear me. But uh, we had some challenges and we started looking at solutions out there. And with that, we reached out to several of the uh, other uh, communities and Scottsdale stepped up and brought us Chief Ford to our Deputy Chief Ford to come up here and help us analyze the situation, create a plan, and present that to our elected officials and go forward. And then this is the fourth of uh, our scheduled four meetings. And hopefully he can answer any questions. And then after we're done with the presentation, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thanks again for everybody coming, and we'll I'll go through some slides. And as I'm going through, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We can stop. There's not that many people here tonight, so it's going to be that upsetting. So we'll answer those questions as we go. This is kind of what we're going to talk about. Um, kind of an outline here, um, an overview. Of, this is the overview of the sections. The introduction, um, as uh, Mike Baxley talked about, my name is Jim Ford. I'm a deputy chief of the Scottsdale Fire Department. Um, I went full time with the Fire Service, the Thor Metro Fire Service in 1975. I worked 30 years with the Thor Metro Fire Department, and then in the last 17 years, I've worked with the City of Scottsdale Fire Department. When that transition happened in 2005, I was one of the ones who made that transition. So I'm an old guy, so if I fall down, please call for help quickly. Don't <laughs> <laughs> <No>, wait. <laughs> well, I got, I got people here that can help me, so. Um, but anyway, I've been around a long time. I've done just about everything in the fire service from the firefighter, EMT, so an engineer, a captain, a, a battalion chief, deputy chief, assistant chief, fire marshal. So I've got the whole gamut. So I think that's one of the reasons they sent me out here. I think the second reason is they didn't send me out. They asked if I would come out and volunteer for this year. The second reason is um, I built my dad's house out here in 1971. So I'm not living currently in Cape Creek, so I'm not an official creeker. I'm an honorary creature. I have a brother, I have cousins, I have you know, a lot of family who lives out here, and I know the area. I grew up in the area. My younger brothers went to the schools out here. You know, so we understand, I understand the area. I understand some of the challenges of the area. And to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this more and more is this is not the same town, the same community, the same area that it was in 1971 when we came out here. It's not the same area that it was 10 years ago. It's not even the same as it was five years ago. This area has just exploded. And that's one of the challenges with everybody. It's not just here, but it's with Scottsdale, with Casey, and with Phoenix, and Mesa, everybody. How do you keep up with the growth in the valley? The valley is a magnet. 
And so that's one of the challenges for this area. That's one of the things we're going through. So we're going to kind of look at all that stuff. But again, I have a good background in the community. I have a good background with the fire service, which is why um, we can ask you just about any questions. So we're going to talk about why we got here, how we're here, why is the big question when our DMS uh, deputy chief, the biggest thing I put on the board was why did this happen? Why can it be better? What can we do better? Why? I'm going to try and answer those questions for you tonight. What are the goals and options that we talk to with the council? And then what's next? Where is this going to go? Or what's going to happen? So again, initial coverage out here, and I actually worked at that station on the southwest corner of Tom Darlington and Cape Ridge Road, if you remember, down to the little shops. And um, that covered this entire area for a lot of years. Uh, Carefree ended up building a fire station in Carefree, and then second row metro station was opened as a car wash. Is it bubbles? Is that what that right? Bubbles. Or bubbles, car wash? Okay, bad idea for a fire guy to talk about bubbles. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So, but anyway, <laughs> that the car wash opened in 2005. Um, currently, in Cape Creek, the service model is individual subscription. You as a resident have a subscription with Pro Metro. Okay, in Carefree, there's a master contract. So in Carefree, it's an individual subscription. And what's interesting is it's still only about 40 to 45% of the people participate. So you have a minority of people <coughs> paying for your service, or paying to have the service at least available in the area. Um, so the master contract with Carefree occurred in 2004, 2005. And then right now, the situation is there's intermittent mutual aid agreements with Pro Metro. Um, the private companies with Pro Metro and the surrounding areas. Okay, with Phoenix, there's an intermittent one with Casa, there's an intermittent one with Daisy. Uh, Daisy said they would help us if we have a problem in town. But it's not an official contract, it's just an intermittent contract. Okay, um, Pro Metro and Cape Creek and Carefree are not members of a regional automatic aid system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What is the automatic aid system? The automatic aid system, just in general, before we get into it, is the second largest response group, second only to FDMY, Fire Department of New York in the country. They're all dispatched with two set, um, dispatch centers. All of the units are going to be interoperable. They can work across lines, across uh, you know, city lines or state lines, not state lines, but city lines, jurisdictional lines. And they help each other out. They're all dispatched by the same. So it's the second biggest singly dispatched group in the country. And that's the Fire Department of New York. A lot of people don't realize that, which is one of the reasons it makes it so effective. But we'll talk more about that as we go on. So why are we here? One of the reasons we're here is because it happens about every five or six years, every few years. There's a major incident. Everybody talks a lot about it. A lot of things look at, get looked at. And then does something happen or not happen? And I'm going to go back a little bit. The Cape Street Complex Fire, which I was in the city of Scottsdale at the time, I was assistant chief. Um, June of 2005, if you lived in Cape Creek at the time, you could see the Cape Creek Complex fire across this northern desert mountain. You could see that fire. And so everybody in the whole area was all worried up about it, and it should have been. It was a big fire. At the time, that was the second largest wildland fire in Arizona history. The second largest started in the valley, in the desert. Everybody thinks all those fires start up north. They don't always start up north. They start here. You can have major fires here. So that's what that was at the time. Everybody came. Everybody assisted with it. That turned out to almost 300 or 250,000 acres. Started just north of it, threatened a lot of the homes in there. Okay? Then we end up having another fire that people talk a lot about. The Buffalo Chip Fire happened around Thanksgiving in 2015. Again, that was a big incident. We had burned a little bit, burned twice. Um, if you look at the pictures on that, what's interesting to note is mutual aid was in effect at the time, and the two latter companies that have a major incident. You have to have the elevated streams. We were talking about that a little earlier. You have to have the elevated streams. The two elevated streams are from Phoenix and Scottsdale. So those jurisdictions, those companies, those fire companies came and assisted with that. Then what happened, why we're here now is the East Desert Fire, May of last year. Almost 1,500 acres started in Cape Creek. Uh, was initially a rural metro and Daisy Mountain response. Then we called in, then they had in essence, we called in everybody. We called in all the help we could get. Regional automatic aid system came and supported those fires in Cape Creek. It assisted with Pro Metro, this is with Daisy Mountain, it assisted Phoenix came, Glendale, all of Peoria came, Scottsdale, all those units came. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, 
Then two weeks later, you had the Aqua Field fire. You had the second fire. Again, lots of structures were burned, lots of structures were threatened, lots of resources were needed. And because of the agreements that we've had or the, the willingness of the other jurisdictions to come, we pretty much stripped the entire north part of the city of the valley, the resources. Okay, they came. They didn't have to come, but they came to the park service, they tried to help out the team. So they came and that was almost a thousand acres. And at the same time, you had the Aquatil Park, which we talked about a little bit more than the Pizzo Park occurred just at the end of that. Then you had a major fire downtown with the Pizzo Park, again, just a disaster. And a major fire assistance can't be asked for. The difference between mutual aid and non Medicaid is mutual aid, one jurisdiction has to call, dispatch calls, the other dispatch says, Do you have anybody available? Can you come? Here's what we need you for, then they'll say, These are the resources we have. Automatic aid is everybody being dispatched out of the same center. They will dispatch the next closest appropriate unit automatically. So it doesn't matter if the next closest unit is any 72 down the street, it's gone. If the next closest unit is Scottsdale 615, it's gone. If the next closest unit is Hayes Mountain 145, 246, they're coming. It doesn't matter. Or much of they're coming. It's automatic, okay? Because it's an automatic dispatch. And the dispatch center knows where everybody's at, so they can see everybody on the map and say, you're the closest unit. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, this, this is the difference, and a lot of people are confused about this. What's the difference between mutual aid and automatic aid? A lot of people say it's the same, and it's absolutely not the same. Okay, it's two separate systems. It's not the same. Mutual aid is you're asking for help, and they can or might, might come and might help, and might not come. Okay, not mandatory and not required for general calls. Automatic aid, regional automatic aid, you don't have a choice. If you're a member of the automatic aid system, and let's say something happens at Cape Creek and Pier Creek Highway, all right, and there happens to be a Glendale truck driving by, the Glendale truck is part of that system, the Glendale truck's taking that call to go to the closest stream. It doesn't matter, okay? If it's a if Scottsdale truck happens to come over here and they're they get a call further out on Pier Creek Highway, it's got to go truck below Pier Creek Highway. That's the closest appropriate call. That's how it works. All right? It's not a request, it's not an ask. It's whoever the closest appropriate unit for what you need. And that applies to all the way through the, the call pipes. That's our EMS will give a major back, a vehicle accident, for example, or level one problems, whatever it is, you're calling for those assistance, that's what you're getting. The closest appropriate unit. Now, why is that important? It's important because the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, has a standard out. Okay, so this is what you should do. This is how the fire department should respond. This is how you should protect your community. Their national standard for deployment says, at an initial dispatch to a residential house, standard 2,000 square foot residential house, is considered a low, um, low event, lower hazard event, even though it's a house fire. But for that initial dispatch, you should be dispatched at least 16 or maybe 17 people in order to handle all of the issues and all the requirements that the firefighters need to do, which includes the safety of the firefighters, right? Not just the residents, the safety of the firefighters. That's one of the handouts over here. If you didn't pick it up, there's a handout that says, here's all the things that that initial response is supposed to do. Okay, so that's what they're saying. In order to do that safely, in order to handle that, that should be 16 people initially. But how does the mutual aid and the regional automatic aid overlap with wildfire services? Like the Cape Creek Complex fire, there were a lot of hotshot units and as well as local units. How is that coordinated? The way that it works with the state is the local units are supposed to respond and make the initial attacks and then start calling for assistance. When it gets to the Cape Creek Complex fire, it turned into a type one incident, which is a major incident. They will fly in the management crews from around the country to take over that and actually took over command of that fire from the Scottsdale Fire Department. The Cape Creek Complex Fire, we had initially Rural Metro and Ace Mountain. We asked for assistance. The Department of Forestry and Fire Management came in. And those of you that saw the air tankers, for example, yeah, it's, it's nice that we ask for those things, but we can't order air tankers. Individual jurisdictions, you can ask for them, but the state, the Department of Forestry and Fire Management, has to order that. So as the that's what that's incident command, that's what it goes and it kind of grows as the incident grows, and you start getting more and more people and more and more resources. But the theory is that your initial response 
your initial backup should be able to handle that. If it doesn't, then that's when you start calling the rest of the world, so to speak. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyway, NFPA says initial low hazard resident, standard resident in the hospital, you get 16 people. Okay, that's an effective response force. So again, we had the East Desert Fire. Obviously, that got out of hand real quick. We called in all kind of resources from the north part of the island. We'll talk about that. Then right two weeks later, we had the second one, the Akatillo Fire. Again, lots of structures that were threatened, lots of people were threatened, lots of animals were threatened. So it took a lot of resources to get that under control again, right? And they all came. So here's what happened to those fires, both of those fires. All of the black dots are stations with other jurisdictions almost. You have the World Metro, um, 821 in Pier 3, you have the World Metro 825 in Pier 3, and these are all other jurisdictions. These are all Scottsdale units, these are Phoenix units, these are Dallas Agent Mountain units, these are uh, Peoria units. Yes. Did they all respond to yes. those fires? Yes. Every one of them? Yeah, every, uh, a unit from every one of these stations went to that fire. Wow. And now, plus, go ahead. What got lost? Plus, well, plus, well, <laughs> but plus, you also had the response from the state. You had the state incident commander come in because we have said again, they're the ones that did the air okay. And this was all with mutual aid, not automatic. That we're coming to. Cape Cricket and Pier Free are not members of the automatic aid right. system, so they asked for assistance, and because of the size of the fire, the other jurisdictions came. That's kind of how we got to where we were at today. I'll, I'll explain that to you. Got it. Okay, but yeah, all of these resources came. Now you can ask for all these resources out of mutual aid, but it's not required for them to come. All right. So what happened is after this, after this incident, the region looked at this and said, "Well, this is nice, but you guys aren't members of the automatic aid system. You guys cleaned out K3, K3, you cleaned out the north part of the valley." We can't be your de facto fire service all the time. Once in a while, from an incident here and there, yeah, but we can't have this kind of impact for all of that part of our city. Yes? A, a, a clarification question. Um, with, this was throughout the entire incident, not all at one time, correct? This was, I believe this was the first day. All of these guys came the first day and then they re rotated through. So, yeah. yeah one one time time yeah. We were there simultaneously. Yeah, that's the question. Every station was blocked. And so responded there. So with the automatic aid system, what happens is there then the, the system then backfills these trucks to try, try to protect those areas. But all those trucks went to that. Yes. If, if that's the case, who was in charge of coordinating all those fire departments? Well, the, the automatic aid ones worked through the automatic aid system. I don't know whether it was your incident commander or your own metro incident commander. Overall, the state ended up taking control of it. Um, there were moments with the state ended up taking command. And so it, it kind of grew. As it grew, it, it moved around a little bit. Initial, initially, and we'll talk about the staffing on the trucks. Initially, you have a captain and you have an engineer and you have two firefighters on the truck. The captain is your initial incident commander. And then the battalion chief, who covers a much larger area, is a, is, is, controls those things, will come in and take over the incident command. And then if he needs assistance, then he calls for additional assistance, like again from the state. Is that the reason you got the first But yeah, my, the question is is that the reason that the air support didn't come until later? The air support is usually going to come a little bit later, yes, because you have to have requested through the state. And the state has to put in their command process to handle the air support. Okay, that's what's going to happen. And it's also going to depend on what's at risk and what's available. All right, so if those air tankers are already on a big fire protecting homes or protecting properties in other areas, there could be a delay because this is the second fire. If it's the first fire, you're okay. If there's a second fire that comes out, it's up to the state to say, I have these resources I can put here or not. But the state will control the air tanker. Again, you should have an agreement with the state in order to say we need those, that assistance. Yes, uh, Jim, just to make a quick comment about the amount of stations that were on this. So this visual just shows north of the 101. I think the 
show a large swath, but th there was quite a few other stations. For example, we had the town of Guadalupe just there, all the way down by 10, uh, by 10 Street and so This is a small representation, but it shows how the entire geographic region was decimated by the response. In my case, the, the question is, or the comment was, this was, it was more was impacted than just this. This was your initial response, okay? Yeah, so additional units from throughout the region, from Mesa, from Chandler, from Glendale, all moved up to help cover the north part of the valley. That's because it was a system, okay? So those, and some of those units actually got here. Now the hot shot crews that you see, that came from, let's say some came from Prescott or some came from Stolo. Those came through the state. The state yes. orders up those crews. They order up crews from the, um, like the, prisons and things like that. They ordered those extra crews, but they're going to be there for a long time. They're going to be there for several days or a week. That's how that happens. <coughs> As the incident grows, they take that opportunity. Who pays for the hot shot? The state? State, right the now. State. <coughs> and that's, yeah, at that time, the state paid for all of that. Yeah, that was the question. What's the difference between purple dots and the red ones and the brown ones? Um, purple dots are the volunteer fire department up in Tunnel Hill. The question is, what's the difference between the color of the dots? Um, Rio Verde um, is a fire district by itself with one fire station. They didn't send anybody because they have to cover their community out there. The black dots are all the ones that responded. The red dots are the ones that got there. These red dots um, were impacted, but they didn't respond into the fire. Activity. But all these black dots responded to that. Okay, and then like, like we said, the other units from the rest of the valley have, have, have helped back to those areas. So that's a big area to leave vacant and not have any responsibility. Okay. Do you have a question? Did you think McCall was mutual aid? Was the rural metro Dave Creek that was coordinating that? But as well, I mean, all of these different the fire department services and other black dots over there? The initial um, call for mutual aid would have come from rural metro. The initial call for automatic aid would probably came from these amount of parking if I'm wrong because they were the first regional unit on the scene. So once automatic aid kicks in, um, that, that just like expands through the whole network? It did expand through the network. It, it was it was a joint command initially and then the state took over and it got big enough that the state took over. But Daisy Mountain is the one that called for the automatic aid from all the automatic aid partners because they're an automatic aid partner. Okay. Everybody else is, is just not. How many rural units? How many rural units? Yeah, for you talk about engines or, or everything? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm aware of four rural metro engines plus their command staff and plus some brush trucks. But there are four rural metro engines. Is that correct? And a few ambulances. Well, and some ambulances. They were the first yeah. ones. The, the thing was, the ambulance was the first thing that arrived on site. And yeah, I asked, where are the tankers? Oh, they'll be here. But they did make a statement. Uh, okay. What address are we? What street is this? Well, I'm, so, I'm not going to. I know, I understand that, but I'm just for documentation. Yeah, I'm not going to get into the initial calls or not. The, the question was <laughs> what firefighting units did they have? Right? I imagine they had some brush trucks because I don't know how many brush trucks you got. But as far as engine companies, I think you have four engine companies, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think you had Cape Creek, you had Pure Creek, you had Rio Verde, which is the other one out here. To the east from, I don't know what that is, about 160th Street. 160th and Dynamite. And then you had uh, Pump Hills. Okay, so there was four rural metro units that initially responded. Okay. So, again, big incidents occur. When big incidents occur, a lot of people talk, a lot of people make phone calls, things happen. So I'm going to go back just a little bit. In November of 2008, um, some things were occurring, and the town looked at what's, what should be our fire service, what should it look like. And the town of Cape Creek actually put together a citizens committee that evaluated the options. They came up with some recommendations. That report is at the town hall. If anybody wants it, we can get you the report. But in essence, um, nothing happened from that. We've talked about, you know, taxing and other stuff. I, I don't know. I think there might have even been a vote for tax. Yeah. But I don't think it happened in 2008. I think the vote was like three years later. So, you know, no people weren't 
know how familiar when, when was the book? I'm just curious. I, I think it was like three years after that, after, after 2008. So it was in 2011 or 2012. I don't know the exact date, um, but that's what I heard correctly from all. Um, and it failed 60 to 40. It was saying, do we want to tax our new property tax in order to do the fire service? So after about three years after the discussion occurred, the vote was taken, failed. Um, so the timing might have been a little bit off. Again, I wasn't here. I don't want to you know, throw stones or anything. But um, so then, after the fires, the town got phone calls from the other jurisdictions, from Phoenix, from Glendale, from Scottsdale, from Peoria. Said, "Hey, this can't continue to happen. You have to do something different." So they were in contact with the town manager, Terry Dyrick. They said, "You got to do something different." Terry started looking. He started working with the council. What can we do different? And in August of last year. They had a, a contract group come out, take a look at the community, and say, here's some basic stuff that you need to do. Here, take a look at it. That was given to the council, and it was put with all the other reports. Okay. So again, I can get you that report too if you want it. So then um, in October, after some, several more phone calls in October, the town received an official letter from the town manager or city manager of Phoenix that said, Thank you very much. We understand that this is the fire service. We understand if you need help, but we're not going to continue this. We're not going to come unless there's a life safety issue. We'll come in and help secure and help stabilize the scene. There's an official letter. And if anybody here wants to copy of those letters, let us know. Talk to Kelly, and we'll get your email address, and I can send you a copy of the letter. You know, you don't have to do a public records request or anything. We can just send those out to you. Um, but that official letter from Phoenix came in October 2020. So then between October and December, the town manager and the council looked at these things, and then that's when they got together with um, the other jurisdictions, and that's when I volunteered to come out here and take a look at this. So there was an official intergovernmental agreement with the town of Cave Creek and the city of Scottsdale, and I basically assigned to the town of Cave Creek uh, since December of last year to look at everything. And basically when I came in and the council people can agree or not, I'm, I'm not a policymaker. I don't get to do that. I get to give you information and the policymakers have to make the decision. They can do that or not do that. You know, and I've said also, I'm gonna tell you what it's gonna be. The fire service is not cheap. As far as if you want the fire service we're talking about, they're just gonna cost some money. I'll be able to give you all those dollars. I'll be able to give you all those costs. And then it's up to the community on what you're gonna do or not. So, that's where we started. That's how we started. That's the discussion. I think pretty much, not verbatim, but pretty much what I told the council. Yes? But I applaud the council, too. They did pay off the other fire uh, departments that came to fight the fire, if I'm not mistaken. The, the question is, did the council pay off the other departments that came? Correct. The other departments that submitted an invoice to the council, pay it. they paid it. If another fire department submitted an invoice to the council, the Cape Creek paid that invoice. Okay, but that was also part of the letter saying you don't get to rent the firefighters on a daily basis. The other communities basically said we pay for this all the time. This infrastructure costs a lot of money. Thank you for doing that, but you don't get to rent that amount of resources on a, on a daily basis. So you need, if you want to be in the system, you have to buy into the system. Is it on record that we could find out the cost of how much they pay for those fire departments? Um, go I, back I, yeah, I imagine we could get to that. I imagine right. we could get that. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't have that. But I was about three hundred and thirty thousand, if I recall. Okay. Is that, total, is that the total amount? Pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Like that. Total. The comment was a total of about three hundred thirty thousand dollars that the town paid to all the other jurisdictions that submitted invoices. Do we also pay the state? We didn't pay the state. I got to know the town did not pay the state, um, which was a point of contention for a long time. They didn't pay for the helicopters, they didn't pay for the air tankers, they didn't pay for the crews. The state um, paid that cost, which was also a discussion with the state because there wasn't an agreement with the state to do that. Okay, the state just did it. So that wasn't in place at the time. Okay, so yeah. The, the, 330 is all those bills, so I'm sure it costs more than that, to tell you the truth. Um, but that's what that's what the town paid out. So anyway, so we got the letters. We I started out here, and so what's happened since then? Well, this year 
Um, I made three, all this stuff is public record. So if anything that I tell you, you can look it up. You can go to the town council website. You can go to the town website and look up any of these meetings. Talk to Kelly and she can get you that link. The link is there also. But you can go in and look at it. Uh, you can look at my first presentation. The, you know, here's where I think we're at on February 16th and then the presentation in March and April. And then we started the budget process. And April 26th was a study session for the, for the council and the budget session. So then we went to the tentative budget and they approved the final budget. So the council has been taking steps on doing some things here. So um, you got to give them a little bit of credit for doing this. I give melodic for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I give melodic for that. This councilman, that's my boss. I, can, <laughs> I guess really, you can carry your boss. You're not my boss. You're your own. Yeah. So anyway. That's where we're at, those events occurred. So here's what my primary goals were when I came out. I told you I was trying to be real clear with everybody, all the meetings and everything. Primary goal is to evaluate the use of mutual aid versus the use of automatic aid. What are the differences? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? What works, what doesn't work? And what's all this gonna cost? Identify the requirements, because the council asked, what does it take for us to be an automatic aid? That's again, one of the handouts that's on the table for you. There are specific things you have to do if you want to be an automatic aid. Okay, it's, and it's not negotiable. And I explained that to the council up front. It's not negotiable. If, if there's anything on these two pages that you don't want to do, if you don't want to run four person staffing, if you don't want to have two medics on your truck, if you don't want to be dispatched by Phoenix or Mesa, that's tell me up front and council can save money and I'll save my time. But you don't, it's not optional. If, if you want to be in the automatic aid system, for consistency reasons, these are all the things you have to do. Okay, so that's what we, that's I gave them that sheet, and again, that's on the table if you want to look. And then look at the community options. What options does the community really have? And I, I'll give you, and I'll show you. I'll give you a list of options. Well, I'll get to that in just a second. But I'll give you a list of options of the decisions that the town council could make, could have made. And again, policymakers make those decisions. I don't. I just gave them those options, so we went through that. So the second thing I did is after putting this outline together, is I looked, I went and talked to everybody in the region. You know, those were major incidents. So this is just a list of the people that I talked to in my first month. Okay, I initially started with the rural metro chiefs. I met with them first and said, "What happened? How did this work? How can we do? What we're going to do for Here's how I'm going to operate. I'm going to do everything in public. I'm going to be open." You, know, you, you might agree or disagree with me, that's okay. But this is how I'm going to operate. And then I started talking to everybody else on there. Um, Department of Forestry and Fire Management is Arizona Department of Justice State. Okay, I talked to all of their chiefs and their executives. Paradise Valley Town Attorney, Paradise Valley has a system where they own the fire stations and they own the equipment and they contract with Phoenix Fire to staff it and cover. And they're dispatched by Phoenix, they're part of the automatic aid system. That happened in 2005. Their contracts run by their town attorney. I happened to know their town attorney, so I called her and she sent me all the stuff that I needed. So I went through all those lists and talked to almost everybody on there. We had a Zoom meeting that was set up by the League of Cities um, shortly after I got here. So myself and the town manager talked to the League of Cities and the, all the cities that were impacted, the Peorias and the Glendales and the Phoenixes, to say, they basically wanted to say, if you don't continue to do stuff, we're gonna we're gonna back out. We're not gonna make that commitment again. And that was a big Zoom meeting that I sat in with the town manager for. And then all the the, the chiefs, the three chiefs that are adjacent to us, you know, Scott Steele and Mason Mountain, those chiefs are obviously involved because they're the ones that the resources are coming from. So we talked to all of those chiefs, all the other ones on there were somehow impacted by those fires or are part of the regional system. All right, so I talked to all of them, said what you know, is it okay? Is the list that I put together consistent with what has to happen? Yes or no, and it was. So that's that's the background stuff that you have to do ahead of time. So again, all of this, the estimates that I put together were to pay for all the system. You know, I wasn't gonna say, that, you know, you can only pay for half of this. This is what it's gonna cost for a fire station, a fire truck, and staffing. It is what it is, it's not cheap. Uh, firefighters are you know, system is expensive. Um, included estimates included immediate and long-term budget impacts. If you're going to do this, you can't hire firefighters for uh, two years. These are these are 20, 25-year employees that you're trying to hire and you're going to put on. 
you're making a commitment to them, they're making a commitment to you. So you can't do this quickly. It's gonna, you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. So the final decisions for the town are gonna fall into three time, three primary areas. And this is, again, comes into a little bit of budgeting stuff. You have your one time or your startup costs, your capital costs. The town is in good shape. They had some money in their savings. The capital cost wasn't a challenge for me. Okay. <laughs> the council person. <laughs> but the, the capital costs weren't an issue. You know, we can talk about that stuff, that's easy. Then there's the annual ongoing operational cost. What does it cost to staff and run a fire station per year? Okay, we have to put all that together for them and say, what's it going to cost as it goes forward? That cost is never going to go down. It's never going to be cheaper than it is today. Okay, it's going to continue to go up. And then, how are you going to do this? How are you going to fund it? Where are your revenue sources? What, how are you going to do this as a town? How are you going to make that commitment and be comfortable that you can make that commitment going forward? So those are kind of the currency has, things that the town looked at. Has the one-time startup capital cost estimate been approved by the town? All of that's in the current budget. It is. And I'll show you show you the current budget number. That's, yes. That's exciting. Yeah, that was all approved with the those three budget hearings that we had, the um, you know, the study session and the two budgets, primary and then final. But I'll show you that. I'll show you what those are. So here's what the town could do. This and this is my mind. This is this is Jim, and again you can throw a command to that here, whatever you want to do. But this is my side of this. There were six options that I gave presented to the council. And you can watch that at those meetings if you want. Each one of these has a whole big background to it if you want to. I didn't bring it for tonight because I don't have time to do that. But but first off is they don't have to make any changes. I'm not saying all of these are good ideas. Okay. <laughs> but these are all options. Okay, they can not make any changes, which has happened before in Cape Trip. Did nothing happen. They don't have to do anything. They can say, well, sorry, we'll roll the dice, we'll do what we want to do. We'll continue with the current system to current process, okay? They could require membership for the community residents and or establish a master contract with Dora Metro. They could do that. They could do that by ordinance. They have to put together a different system. Now, Paradise Valley, when they did theirs, Paradise Valley charges every property owner in Paradise Valley a certain amount each year based on the size of your structure, the size of your lot. And after they did that, they, the people pay the town and then the town pays that contract with Phoenix. The legislature said you can't do that anymore. They, they, they voided it out so that Cape Creek, that's not an option to, to do it that way, but you could enter into a master contract if you wanted to with Royal Metro. Okay, that was an option for them. You could create a new community or regional fire department. You could do a new fire district, okay? Say, let's do this. And, and you can either you can do that part from the start, or you can annex into it existing fire district. For example, you could have annexed into Davis Mountain. Okay? You're not going to annex into Phoenix or Scottsdale, but you could have annexed into Davis Mountain. The issue with that, I found out, I called the, I don't know if you noticed on there or not, but I talked, talked to the uh, Arizona Fire District Association. I said, when was the last time a fire district was developed in Arizona? And it's been years, probably decades. Okay, I said, when was the last time one was tried? The last one that was actually tried with any real thing was the Rio Verde, between Scottsdale and Rio Verde, the area out there in the county, and they tried to do that a year, two years ago maybe, and Rural Metro supported it, the region supported it, they went to vote, and it got blown up. It didn't come close to passing. Okay, and that's after spending and doing all the stuff you need to do. The county and the state say, here's a whole bunch of requirements for you to do that. The requirements are the same whether you start a new one or you start a maintenance. It doesn't matter, you have to get the signatures, you have to do the, the outreach and all that, it's all the same. Doesn't matter if you do either one. So then they can develop and install their own standalone top department, make a Cape Creek Fire Department. And in essence, you're going to put in all the overhead and the chiefs and the EMS captains and the personnel folks and HR folks, and you're going to have all of that for one station in the town with double in size. Just with the one fire station, I'll explain that to you in a minute. The town would double in size, with the number of employees would double in size. Or we could do kind of like the Phoenix model and, and Curtis Valley model, or which is what Rural Metro does with Care Creek right now. Care Creek owns the station, they own the truck, they contract with Rural Metro to staff it. If you want to be in the automatic aid system, which the council said they wanted to be in the automatic aid system, then we needed to contract with an automatic aid provider. 
and we needed to meet those requirements. So that's the, the final one. Contract for the fire service. Have the town get a fire station, have the town get the equipment, have the town be partially vested in this, and then contract with an automatic aid provider. Which those departments, Daisy Mount, for example, they have all that in place. They would charge us up for that, but they have all that in place. They have the EMS captains, they have the administrative captains, they have the chief, they have all of that in place already. Yeah. The presents a rural venture upon the part of the automatic aid. Uh, uh, Rural Metro actually asked to be a part of the automatic aid system. They talked to the Central Arizona Life Safety Committee and they were turned down for the letter says pretty much why they were turned down. But part of it is um, also because it is a for profit profit company. So you have jurisdictions and you have governmental entities contracting with private companies. Now you can do that, but it causes a lot of different problems. And on the emergency services side, there's some other challenges. But one of the reasons is it's a private for profit company. But, you know, again, that's something they have to go through. Rural Metro did ask this year after this, all this happened, and they got a response back. And again, those are in the letters that you want to see them. The response from Rural Metro and the response from the CAPS. This is a little bit question, but um, the town boundaries are all the question is if there's county areas and it's not just north but there's county areas around the community uh, that's not in the town so as this goes forward that's part of the discussion we're having with the town what are we going to do for those county areas there's several options um again i don't want to get too far out over my skis here but there's you can annex in, or you can, the, the state will allow a small county area to do their own fire district and, not, and, and contract with their closest provider. So that's an option down the road. Um, or we don't, we haven't got that far yet. I don't know if the town's going to allow you to individually contract with the town. I think that um, Daisy, correct me if I'm wrong, Daisy has allowed people in county areas to contract with Daisy uh, Fire District. Yeah, if there's no other service in that area. Occasions, if there's, if there's no other service areas in that area, they've allowed that. So that would be an individual discussion we have to have. So, yeah, because that, that's where the shifts. Sure, sure, sure. You should be should be concerned with that. So here's on the list. Here's the automatic aid requirements. This is not all of them by any means, but this is you know, just take a quick look at them. You have to be dispatched by Phoenix or Mesa. That's for consistency. They know where all the vehicles are. If my club truck is closer than your truck, my truck's gone. It doesn't matter jurisdiction. Um, you have to be able to address your community first. You know, what are your normal issues in your community? You have to do that first. Then you're required to uh, train the same. You're required to have the same command training. You're required to have the same. All of the firefighters in the region that are in the automatic aid system go to four academies. Glendale, Phoenix, Chandler, and Mesa. So even though Scottsdale, as an example, has been in the automatic aid system now for 17 years, we still don't have our own academy. We're still sending our new folks to those four academies for consistency reasons. Our commanders do the regional training so that they're all consistent. So it doesn't matter if you get a Scottsdale Battalion Chief in Phoenix or if you get a Daisy Mountain Battalion Chief in Scottsdale, it doesn't matter if there's consistency there. That's for firefighter safety also, that's for scene safety for both residents and, and the system. Um, full staffing, we talked about full staffing. Again, that's four people on a truck, that's a captain, who's your, your manager, and your initial incident commander, that's your engineer, your driver, who can make sure everybody gets there and back safe and runs that thing. And then two firefighters, and, and two of those four people in the system have to be advanced life support medics. Two of them are advanced life support medics. We all have medical directors that we work for. We all work with the various um, emergency rooms. And the medical director that I work with basically said that engine company can do as much on the scene as I can do in the ER with the exception of surgery. They can, they, and so they respond, they stabilize, and then they set up for transport. Okay, so that's that's the whole idea. Is if you have a major accident, those those folks can do almost everything for you. 
you're not going to get better service. All that came from the Vietnam era, way back when we started talking about all that stuff. That's where the medics stuff. Who knows emergency? Who saw or saw emergency? Okay, Julie. <laughs> um, so again, the full staffing is four members, and then the contract is an actual intergovernmental agreement for the automatic agents. It's an actual contract that you're going to do this and you're going to maintain these level of service. You have to do it. If you don't do it, then they can dump you out of the system if they want. Okay? But you have to maintain that level of service and that level of protection. So that's what the Central Arizona Life Safety Council, when I say CALS, that's what I'm talking about. They're the, they're the chiefs from all of the fire departments that are in it. I think there's 28 chiefs in, in that now. Everybody has a vote. Okay. The executive committee of interest of the general committee. So they all have a vote. So again, I put this map up just again as references for you. So this is what's in the area for the, the northern part here. So you have the Care Creek Station, 821, Cape Creek Station, 825. There's Scottsdale, 16, 15, 14, 13. You have Daisy Mountain. Uh, this is a potential new station that's been discussed. That's 140, 144. 144, they do have 141, 145. There's more Daisy Mountain stations over here. Phoenix, just south of Care Creek Highway, 72 and uh, 52, I think it is. And so this is what's in the area. I'm going to go back and let's talk a little bit about, let's say we have a house fire in Cape Creek, right? We have a house fire in Cape Creek. It's dispatched as a house fire. What does NFPA say you're supposed to have? 16 people on initial dispatch, right? So initially, if we have a house fire in Cape Creek, you have four coming with this engine company with Pro Metro. You have two on the ambulance and three on an engine company coming from Care Creek, right? So we're at nine. You have a battalion chief up here. And then does anybody know where the next rural metro station is coming from? Someone from Rio Verde and 160th Street. So if they don't call for mutual aid or they don't receive mutual aid, they're going to start fighting a house fire with nine or ten people, which they, these guys bust their ass and they do good. They work hard at it. But I don't know that it's safe for them or it's safe for you. It's as safe as it should be. If you're in the automatic gate system and you have a house fire in Cape Creek, you'll probably get Care Creek, you'll probably get Phoenix, depending on where it's at. You get Daisy Mountain or you get Scottsdale. You know, usually you get three engines and a ladder and a command office, or at least one command officer with lots of this too. Okay? And you're going to get that on the first dispatch and the closest units are coming. Okay? You don't have to wait for a truck to pass for their resources. It doesn't happen. Yes. Does the rural metro get called in now that like Scottsdale or Phoenix if there's an incident? <laughs> or do you need help? I mean, does it work in reverse? The, the question is, does rural metro get called into Scottsdale or Phoenix? And the answer is for mutual aid, it can be. That's the idea. It's mutual aid, but it doesn't happen very often. It can, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, usually because the dispatch center is already sending the close into. So, yeah. But that's why, that's why. Again, it's called mutual aid versus automatic aid. Okay, so that's that's again back a little bit. But that's where the that's where the town and the area would benefit from having all the resources. Which again is what happened when you had those two parts. All those resources, like you look at the earlier one, came. And if you're in the automatic aid system and you bought in and you're supporting it, then that's all. It's all done. It's all taken care of. It's not. Can you send us some more resources? And the answer is yes or no. Currently, the answer is, is it a life safety system or issue? If it's a life safety issue, we'll probably send something. If it's just to help you know, do your normal work, we might or might not send it. And that's up to the individual jurisdictions. Okay? That's, but those are the decisions. It's not automatic, and it's not even as mutual as it used to be. So again, here's the, the looking at, at what we're trying to do here. There's your one-time startup costs. This gets to your questions from a little bit earlier. What is that? That's your initial dispatch equipment, that's your fire station, that's your fire engine, that's your equipment that you're putting on the, the truck. Monitors now are costing like $25,000 just for a car monitor or more. You know, so it's very expensive to put all this stuff on the truck. 
that's all capital. So a town saying we have the capital funding, we can purchase all this stuff, then that changes it to, you know, we're not we're not financing fire stations, we're not financing engine companies, including the startup. They can, they still have that option. But initially they don't have to do that. But that puts them in a better position to say we have skin in the game and we're we want to be a player. And then you go to your annual ongoing costs. And your ongoing costs um, for a fire truck, for one four-person fire truck, fully staffed, 24-7, 365 days a year, is 15 people. 15 full-time people to cover time off, to you know, help cover if somebody gets hurt, things like that. You have to do 15 people, not 12. All right? So that's for one year. And again, you're going to include all your benefits and all that stuff has to be included in there because it's going to, you don't, you don't get to say we're going to hire this many people and we're not going to pay you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm noticing now you, you list the tier three. Tier three is a, a brand new firefighter, right? <laughs> yeah, new firefighters now. Everybody talks a lot about the pension systems that the state has, which is public safety, PSPRS, public safety retirement system. And the previous system had some funding challenges. But the legislature and the fire departments all worked through that, and that's all been handled up. So anybody we hire now is considered a tier three for retirement purposes. So my, so my question would be, you're going to put an engine with 15 people that are all ready, not an engineer or a captain? Absolutely or, not. Okay. Absolutely so not. Be higher paid or higher tier in the, business, correct? The question is, are we going to put all brand new people on the station at Cape Creek? Because you need captains and engineers and all that stuff. The answer is no because that's why we're contracting with an existing service. The right. existing service has, the existing service has the people that will transfer or promote into those positions and we will backfill and, and add new positions. Correct. And they'll all be different. However, they would not all be tier three. Your 15 people would not all be tier three. Probably right? not. Right, they'd be tier one all the or higher pay be, or whatever. Right? That's all figured in. Okay. That's all figured but in. That, that line seems to indicate that there would be 15 brand new people at a tier. No, I'm cost. sorry. I'm sorry if it looks like that. That's not the case. That's why you contract with an existing service who already has, I don't know, I don't know how many guys you got, 100, 150 people already for the services that they have. You would contract, and then the, the second part of that is, and it's been asked, and I'll answer it here. It wasn't asked today, but um, what are you going to do with the people that are with Rural Metro that are currently serving the town and have been serving the town? For a long time, and if we contract or we're working with a contract with Easy, they would offer a lot of those folks an opportunity to come across if they want to. They don't have to. For Scottsdale, I'll talk about how it happened in Scottsdale. When we did that, we had um, about 230 firefighters at the time. We had 13, 14 stations, and about 80 percent of those firefighters came across when we did the transition. We're not going to force anybody to come across, but when they do come across, the same thing. Though they're going to have to meet all the current standards. You know, they're going to have to be in good physical condition. They're going to have to pass the test. They're going to have to do that opportunity. So that those opportunities are going to be there. And we already heard that from the chief. And, and with those people that you would offer those jobs, would they come across at their same current rates? Like a guy with 20 That's years coming across with his 20 year pay? Or would you go back to the brand new fire? That's all to be determined because that's a whole new personnel issue that's going to be individual departments going to that. That's going to be actually going to be a labor issue too, labor and personal departments. Yes. These are all costs, but is there any like a, a big economic benefit, right? Is protecting your personal property, right? But is there any other economic benefit of having a Cape Creek fire department? What is there a value? The property values increase. Um, are, are there any metrics there that? I want to increase into what they already are. <laughs> the, the question is, what else does this get you? What does the automatic gate system get you? You know, why is this a good purchase or not a good purchase? And again, I'm and I hate to keep doing this. I go back to Scottsdale because that's where I grew up and that's what I learned. I did the all the transition. Scottsdale gets about two to two and a half extra engine companies worth of response every year because we're in the automatic aid system. Because our partners with Phoenix and our partners with Tempe and the South Side can help us. If we didn't have that, we had to just do it with Scottsdale units, we would probably have to have another two to two and a half engine company. Same thing's gonna happen here. Cape Rick was just to say. Forget it, we should just do it by ourselves, then you should probably count on three engine companies and ladder and some more kind of changes. It's gonna you're gonna have to extend that. So the the long term stuff is your community gets graded. And I don't know what the community grading is for Cape Creek right now, but your community gets graded. 
it's on a scale of one to ten. If anything below a five, doesn't matter for residential, only matters for commercial. But those opportunities will be there. And uh, your insurance company is going to ask you, where's your closest fire station? Where's your closest hydrant? All that stuff. We work with the town now. We're trying to upgrade the water system. We're trying to upgrade all that stuff to make it better. In fact, we're going to give a whole new map of the water system to the Phoenix Dispatch so that all the automatic aid partners that are coming in will know where those hydrants are and know where the roads are a little bit better than they have in the past. So all that stuff, the, the continuity is what, what, what you gain. Yeah. Has a decision been made by the town? Not officially. The, the question was, has a, has a decision been made by the town what to do? And it's not officially. It's, that's why I had all those meetings to discuss that. Um, that all the meetings will be in the public. You know, all the decisions will be made in public. But there's there's contract issues and all kind of issues that we got to get through. Um, and I'll show you how far we have gotten. I think you'll be surprised. Let me finish with real quick the ongoing costs. Um, again, is, is your payroll and includes you have to pay for dispatch every year. So if you go on 800 calls a year, you have to pay Phoenix to dispatch you for 800 calls a year. It's about $80,000 a year for the dispatch. That's not counting the initial system, but you, you're paying for that service. And again, we wouldn't do Mesa, we'd probably do Phoenix. Okay. So here's, -da, here's, here's your questions. All right, this is, what does this cost? So again, capital items, this is the, where the town has money, I keep saying your party, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it, the town says, okay, we have some savings. Tell us, Jim, what is this going to cost to start up a fire department? And you have to remember, please remember that we're starting with a blank, blank sheet. Okay, Cave Creek does, is, we're not like Paradise Valley, we're not like Carefree, we're not like Fountain Hills, which is a, another rural metro system. And those, those towns own those resources. We don't have any of that yet. We don't have any of that yet. So we're starting with a blank sheet. And so what I brought to the town was for capital items, it's gonna cost you $260,000 worth of capital items for equipment to dispatch and radios. Okay, you gotta have the right radios in the truck, but they need to be able to get a hold of you. They need to have the vehicle locators on them, all that stuff. That's gonna cost you about $260,000 to, to start up, just to start, okay? And then you have a fire station, and we look at three options for fire stations. And we're looking at still looking at those. No final decision has been made yet by council, but we're working on that. But you have to have a fire station where you're going to put the coach. You're not going to put them in a tent. You have to give them a place to stay. They live with those fire stations. Your apparatus, again, these are estimates cost about $750,000 and about $200,000 to, to staff to, or to equip it. It's not cheap. You're looking at almost a million dollars to put a fire, new fire truck in place, okay? And if you crash one, that's why you have insurance, because it's gonna cost you a million dollars to replace it. You recruit new employee training for 15 people to put them into the academies, it's $4,500 a piece. So it's gonna cost you almost $70,000 just to train the new folks, okay? You still have to get into those academies, you still have to put the trainers there with them. Your turnout gear, your equipment, your personal protective equipment for the firefighters. You do two sets, it's about $4,500 to $5,000 each. So for, for 15 people, $150,000. That'll work for a few years, but again, that stuff's gonna wear out, right? You can go to one fire and take out four sets of turnout. You have to replace that. But this is what you need to start. You don't have anything that you have to start to get this initial equipment. So total, what I brought to the council, was about five point six million dollars of capital of startup. And you go, okay, how are you going to fund that? Remember the other, the third thing is how are you going to fund it? And the council and the town at the study sessions and that said we have, we have the savings. You read, you know, you can read the budget stuff as well as I can. So we have the savings. We can afford this as a startup. Okay, great. The next thing is you better look at your your budget items, your annual ongoing costs. What's it going to cost you to start it? And then what's it going to cost it to keep doing it? So this is an, a one-year budget. Your dispatch, because of the number of calls, they're going to cost you about $80,000, $82,000 a year to pay to dispatch. The equipment comes up front, but the actual service for dispatching is about $80,000 a year. Your station costs, you've got fire furniture and equipment, you've got computers, you've got phones, you've got maintenance, you've got utilities, all of that is going to Never be cheaper. It's going to be ongoing. We start here, we continue on. Then your vehicle apparatus 
you know, luckily we're going to start with a new vehicle, so we shouldn't have that much vehicle maintenance and stuff. It should be under warranty, but you still have your fuel and you have things like that. So you can, you can read through that as fast as I can. Your staffing by itself, with 15 people, two medics, all the training and everything you need is about $2 million a year. So is that ever going to go down? No, it's not. It's not ever going to go down. But you have to start with that and you have to make sure you have that funding. Again, if you have to replace a couple guys during the year, it was your academy cost, your turnout replacements, I put in three sets of turnouts. Again, you can do four sets of turnouts at one call. You don't have to replace that. I talked talk to TV, I told you I talked to Paradise Valley. They put money in their contingency because there's no way that I can, or the council, or the fire department, anybody can say, we know exactly this is what's going to happen this year, this upcoming year. You can't do that. You try, and you do your best, and you use your experience. But even with Paradise Valley, they have between 100 and 200,000 contingency just if you break a monitor, they need 30,000 dollars. So that's how it works. So that's what you have to do. So the town budgeted temporarily about two and a half million dollars for an annual cost, which is what it's going to cost us each year, about two and a half million dollars. Question? Quick, yeah, quick question on this one. Uh, 2.5 million for annual expense for the station, correct? One station. This is for the staffing. Yes, the, right. the question is, is it two and a half for one station, which is the staffing and the station and the equipment and everything in the station and your dispatch? Yeah. Within automatic gate system. Within the automatic gate system. I'm like, my question then is, uh, I think Tolleson is an automatic gate station, correct? Yes. One station? Yes. And their annual is about 4.7 billion a year. Yeah. How? The question is, and then Rio Verde has a non non automatic aid at about 3.4 million a year. So how does this come in so much lower than those other two single station? The question is, parts? when the automatic aid system, Tolleson has one station, and it comes in it's actually higher than four and a half million dollars, or closer to six. Um, and Tolleson has one station. The reason Tolleson is only about nine square miles. Tolleson is in the middle of a commercial industrial zone. If you're familiar with the I-10 going east, they're going west. And that one station has, Tolleson has the entire fire department for one station that they're paying for, like we talked about earlier. They have an engine company, a fully staffed engine company, a fully staffed ladder company in there. They have a public education person, they have a chief, they have an EMS director, and they have staff, office staff to run that department for inspections and things like that. So it's a lot more than one truck. That's why it's less than Tolleson Real Verde currently has one station, they're expanding to two stations, but they're running two engine companies because they've already put on the second engine company. So if you want to cut this in half and add an engine company to it, then you're going to be real close to Real Verde. And Real Verde has the, similar to what Daisy Mountain, Real Verde has the ability to have its own ambulance, and the ambulance pays for some of that stuff because they run their own ambulances from Real Verde and they cover that east, eastern area. So but there again, there's more resources there. And the same thing, Rio Verde has its own fire chief, it has its own fire prevention captain, and it has its own training, prevention training captain type position. So they are, they have to be self-contained. And they're not in the automatic aid system. They're, they're dispatched by Mesa, okay, but they're not in the automatic aid system because they don't have any contiguous boundaries. They have Fountain Hills and Rural Metro on the south, and then Rural Metro on the Dynamite River. So they don't have and they're not in the system. Okay, but they are stand completely standalone, completely isolated. Is this kind of like a chicken or egg thing? I mean, so with, with automatic aid, like are we guaranteed, would you be guaranteed to get an automatic aid? Are you assuming that you know, we're, we're building up these prices and are accepted as automatic aid? But what has to come first to make that visible? What I'm doing is I'm trying to run parallel tracks. Actually, three tracks. Okay, and that's one of the reasons that you contract with an automatic aid provider like Daisy Mountain, who's already in the system, and the system has to accept you in. So if we put in all this stuff, if we meet the requirements, which is you saw in the initial slide, I talked to every one of those chiefs and I said, if we can meet the requirements of the automatic aid system, will this bring you in? And the answer is, yeah, we, we can bring you in. And they're going to look at what do you bring into the table or not? Are you a are you assisting it or are you not assisting it? You know, we just can't do the same thing. So that's one of the challenges and one of the discussions that we have. So we are kind of an outpost, but that's all been included in those discussions. Yeah. Jim, can you speak to your ambulatory uh, service and response? The question is, can we talk to the ambulance service 
question and response, right? Right. Okay, it's, what you need to do is you need to kind of separate two things. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is understand that in the Valley and the automatic aid system, the fire service is your emergency medical service. Okay, that's why there's two medics on every truck. That's why we have the equipment we have. We are your emergency medical service. We're going to respond. We're going to stabilize. We're going to treat. And then we'll prepare you for transport. The ambulance service is a transport. And it doesn't matter if you have Daisy Mount or you have Maricopa or you have Rural Metro or you have AMR on the west side. That's a transport service. Okay, and it's to take you from there to the hospital. The transport service is completely controlled by Department of Health Services. Okay, the Arizona Department of Health Services controls the ambulance service. So they're the ones that set the rates. They're the ones that, that you ask for, do I have approval to respond in this area or not? It's called a certificate of necessity. And so Daisy Mount, for example, has a certificate of necessity for their entire, entire, entire fire district. Rural Metro has a certificate of necessity for this whole North area currently, okay? Also, Maricopa Ambulance has a certificate of necessity for this whole North area. For Scottsdale, Scottsdale Fire doesn't have a, a, a CLN or certificate of necessity, but we have a contract with Maricopa who does, okay, and can provide that transport service to us. So that's, it's, it's important, but it's in reality a little bit of a secondary issue because we can find and we can call in ambulances or resources to help us transport that. Okay, so that's what we'll do as we continue to, to grow and continue to mature. We'll look at those different things. There's options. You can extend Daisy Mountain's certificate of necessity if you want. Go to the state and apply for that. You can do your own if you want. If you want to apply and go through that process. But those are those are options as you go down the road. But you need to keep in your mind back up again that the your initial emergency medical response is is the fire service. Okay, there's options for transport, but your fire service is getting there for your heart attack or your car accident is what takes care of that. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. Okay. okay. So anyway, all this stuff went through those meetings that I, I showed you a little bit earlier, the town council meetings, you can go look at them. So where do you where do we go from here? So this is the this is what the council has to struggle with. And again, I'm glad it's them and not me. I just get to talk and throw stuff at them and they get to make these decisions. But here's what you have to look at. You have to have general fund revenues. How much revenue is the town bringing in through sales tax or whatever, you know, um, share state, state share of revenue and all that kind of stuff. You have to bring all that in and figure it out. You have to figure out what is your full year funding for the town? What's it cost to run the town now? And that's great. And then on top of that, let's add Full year funding for the fire protection. Let's add two and a half million dollars. Can you still afford that? Yes or no? Okay. How can we use the capital funds to, to reduce our, our annual lot? And then, is there other areas in the budget that we can look at to reduce either services or find extra revenue? That's what the town council is looking at now. What, what are those other options? Okay. Where are they going to get that money? And then again, you can do a sales tax increase for public safety, you can do a property tax increase for public safety. And once you have your fire department ID number, which Cape Creek now has, we filed for and got it, fire department ID number, we can now start requesting grants from the state and from the national. And so the grants, some of those can be huge, some of those can be very large for equipment like brush trucks or staffing and things like that. But we're able to do that now. We weren't able to do that. So that's all that has to happen with the town. And that's, that's what they're struggling with right now. I don't want to say struggling. I'm not, you're not struggling. That's what, they're, that's what they've been presented with now. So, yeah, question? Uh, firefighters for rural Metro also receive pensions from the state like the other firefighters in the departments? The question is, did rural Metro firefighters receive the state pension, the public safety retirement plan? Yes. And the answer is no. The answer is no. They have a... Um, I don't know if they have a place stock ownership still. They have the 401k system. They have Social Security. They have other ones, but they're not part of the state public safety retirement system. And um, I've never been part of that system. Okay, and so that's that's a little bit different. That's why even for me, when I transferred from Rural Metro after 30 years to the city of Scottsdale, I had to learn that whole system. That was completely different. Basically, started from scratch on that. Condition. Okay. Okay, so again, everybody, what's the money? Everybody, tell me about the money. And again, this is just 
for you know display purposes. And so we can talk about it a little bit. But what I did is I took several of the houses that I know about in town. The year they were built, the square footage just all came from the county. You know, the county has all these records. The town doesn't make this up. And then the assessed limited property value, which is how the county tracks everything. Okay. So Daisy Mountain, you have to understand with Daisy Mountain, if you're in the Daisy Mountain Fire District, the only way they can get revenue is through property tax. They don't have sales tax, they're not an incorporated community. You know, they, they don't get state share revenue other than a little bit that the, the legislature gives for fire districts, but they have to do it through property tax, okay? And so Daisy Mountain, if you had this house in the center of town, it would cost you, if you were a Daisy Mountain, it cost you a little over a thousand dollars a year. Maybe not quite that much. I think this is a little bit higher. But that's about what it would cost you for taxes for Daisy Mountain for that size house. This is the town average for the budget folks. This is the example from the report that came in um, in August when he came and looked at it. He said this is a house that he picked. At. That's why I don't know what size or what year because I don't know what house he picked. I just know that this is what it costs based on value. So that's what it would cost if we were Daisy Mountain. If you're a rural metro, and that's how big your house is, this is what you would pay for Rome Metro. Okay, that's your annual Rome Metro fee. Those of you that pay it, those should be pretty close to the actual numbers that you have from Rome Metro. Yes? Has the amount compared to the Creek as far as the size of the town residents, uh, properties? So it's, Daisy Mountain is a lot larger. That's why, what do you have, five fire stations or four fire stations? Five? And uh, Cape Creek is, I think it's 38 square miles. You guys are covering about 200 square miles or so. Uh, population is about 50,000 because they have Anthem and all that. Population of Cape Creek is about 6,000. So we're, if you were to take one Daisy Mountain station and plug it in Cape Creek, our concept, it would be about the same, okay? So that's how it works. So anyway, I, I did the comparison based on, uh, these are real houses. This is what Daisy Mountains is. Just for comparison, this is rural metros. And if the town said, we need $2 million out of property tax, because it's two and a half million dollars a year, and that, and that number can change. But they said, we need $2 million worth of property taxes. What's that gonna be? This is what it would cost. So you, in almost in every single case, it's less than what the current rural metro is, it's way less than what Daisy Mountain is, because again, they don't have others. But that's the advantage, is the town can then say, we have sales tax, or we have, state share revenue, we have other sources that we can put together to pay that contract, whatever that contract number ends up being. The town has the ability to do that. This, and I want to make one clarification statement because I've been asked this before. They said, well, you don't have vacant properties on here. You don't have commercial on here. I don't have the rates for a vacant property or commercial. That's the county that says that. But this $2 million includes all of that. So that's everybody in town having a little bit of skin in the game and buying it. And if the town says we want $2 million worth of tax revenue, this is what the rate would be for a residential property, okay? But I can't tell you what a, 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 a lot would be. Um, it's gonna depend on the assessed value of the lot. I didn't, I didn't look up any of those lots. So that, that was one of my questions. The other one is just questions. clarification of town location. Okay. If you could clarify those a little bit where it says hillside, center of town, what's it? Where would that be? Okay. If your car, if your land. The question is, can you clarify where my notes are? <laughs> <laughs> this is my notes. Okay, I get to do this. So, so the hillside is on Black Mountain. Okay. The center of town is actually in the core, what would be considered the core of town. Okay. On the west side of town, and the west side of town, I have two of them over there. That I looked at different sizes, different um, built different times, but it's everything on the west side of the Seven Sisters of the Mountain. Okay, north part of town is probably in the area of Fleming Springs, maybe a little bit north of Spur Cross and Schoolhouse in Fleming Springs. The condo, and condo is a bad term. I shouldn't say condo. Nobody likes that up here. But you know, townhouse. And this is more in the center of town. Again, so that's so I tried to go center of town. I tried to go mountainside. I tried to go West side of town, I tried to go northern out towards Spur Cross so everybody could see these are actual homes and this is this is what it would be. It's based on it's based on again your assessed limited property value and
and it's times hundred dollars on the grade. So now the town has the ability. Again, this is just for you know display purposes. The town can come back and say, I want to pay for all of the property taxes, and that would adjust that rate up. Or they can say, I want to pay for half of that with property taxes. You know, 1.3 instead of two, and that would adjust that rate down. Okay, that's those are the tough decisions that the council has to make. And those are the ones that they'll be discussing. In the, probably not too distant future. Now, if the town council has the ability to say, if we want to raise the sales tax, they can do that on their own. If they want to do a property tax, similar to what we talked about at the start, that will have to go out to the community, and the community will have to vote on it. And the community will then say, we either want it, we want to change it, we want this different level of service, or we want this new service, or we don't. And then that, that takes it back to the, the policymaker. Question. Would that be a proposition or a petition? How would that work? With the only way you can do property tax in Arizona is the council has to say, yes, we want to put it on a ballot, which would be October, November timeline. And then it would come around. How many of you voted on the? Uh, May. Uh, May. What? May, the May election. Yeah, and May you voted on the uh, strategic plan for the city. Right. That's, you can only do that, and you can only do property taxes in May. So you have to say, yes, we're going to do it in October or November, and it has to be in the May ballot. And you can only do it once a year. You can't say, like, you can't say, now, hey, let's do this in November. You, you can't not have to do that. The state makes you do that. So, yes? On the right-hand side there, does that assume that 100% of the pay by property taxes or just? No, that was, the question is, on the right-hand side, how much is paid by property taxes? I just said, Okay, what would if because I know there's other revenue sources, but what if we got two million for property taxes? What would that rate be? I just that's just me pulling that out of the air. Two point six. If you recall going back to the annual cost, it was about two point six, two point seven. So that would be a little bit higher. Um, if you want, and I can actually figure that out in the council. We'll take a look at that. But they want to pay for the entire service out of property tax. Okay. But that's those are options. Um, I don't know. If, uh, I don't know. Speak to the council. It's going to be up to their choice. But they're going to have all the information, and that's all we can do. And they're going to they're going to come back and be talking to you all and your friends. So let everybody know that this discussion is going on. That's why we're doing these outreach. Let the discussion and make them call the council and have them talk. You got to start throwing stuff. They, there's there's a gentleman with tomatoes that's going to hit me on my shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let the council know what you think about this. You know, I'm, I don't have a vote. I don't make a decision. You know, they're the ones that are going to make these decisions. So we're giving them all the information they can, and then they'll bring that out to us. Does that make sense or not make sense? So here's here's what's going on next. Here's what we've done, and here's where we're going. You know, establish it. The council has had a resolution that they adopted it. In March, it said we want to be in the auto aid system. We think that that's a better system. We think that's better for our community. So they would actually adopt a resolution for that. Um, we adopt a resolution for the Department of Forestry and Fire Managers. We have a contract and agreement with them to help with the upcoming fire season, which we're hopefully we're almost through. This is going to rain so much, things like that. So we'll be here. Yeah. Everybody do a little bit. Yeah. Don't go too crazy, but we're getting there. You know, and then you know, those are the initiatives that we did. You know, outreach programs. We've been trying to do that. That's what this is. Um, preliminary contract discussions. We've given that there to the council. We work with Daisy Mountain quite a bit to talk about what's it going to take to have them to be a contractor for us, to be a service provider. None of those contracts are done. They're all in discussion stage, but the, the things are happening. And again, I'm going to say, even if you wasn't here, I'd say. The council has been very supportive of, of my activities and the town's activities. You know, the, the council and, and Cape Creek would put on notice. Whether you like it or agree with it or don't, doesn't matter. We would put on notice and the council and the town manager would respond in, in my view, from, from my position. So I think that you've got to give them some credit for that. And it's not over and you still have some tough decisions. To make. Yep. So is it your assessment that uh, for Cave Creek, one fire station with auto aid staffing is sufficient coverage for the size of the town and the, the question is, area? The question is, is it my assessment that for Cave Creek, one fire station with auto aid can cover the entire town? And that's not what I presented to council. We have to start with one fire station. We still have a challenge on the west side and we have to evaluate the north side. 
you know, so Cave Creek with our 6,000 residents and 38 square miles still has to be evaluated. Currently, you have one fire station. The town has to start someplace. We have to start one fire station. And then as this works its way through and as the, the system matures, we'll work with our partners to say what needs to happen next. So what should we have next to make sure we give some consistent coverage for the town. So you know, I think the one fire station can cover Cape Creek forever now. And that's not what I told the town. Again, that's my opinion and those evaluations will still be done. And then uh, they'll hear all the pros and cons of all of that stuff. Okay. Probably missed something, but that mutual aid decision comes before the vote for the or as part of the vote for the tax and the concept. Let me see if I understand it. You mean the automatic aid? Yes. Whether we're in the automatic aid system or not the automatic aid system? That's that's one of the goals is to be far enough down the road that we can say if we were to contract. This would be part of the automatic aid system. We're going to work on that. It's it is a chicken and egg. We said that the chicken and egg system. Yay! Um, but that, again, those are on parallel tracks. You have to still be accepted and show that this is a benefit to the automatic aid system. You have. That's why you have the list of stuff, which is where I started. You have to do this stuff. For, if you don't want to, then okay, don't. But, then you don't have other options. Your other options is to stay with the system or do mutual. So yeah, those are, and that's one of the reasons that you work with a partner that's already in the system. They know better than I do even what's in the automatic aid system with the requirements. So we'll work with them and use their expertise as part of it. They already have a contract for dispatch. Okay, I can calculate the numbers, but they have the, the connections and all that type of stuff. Yeah. That's an interesting point about the number of stations needed in, in Cape Creek because there's a risk then, right? I mean, what's the minimum amount to get in, like one station, but then you have know, contract to pay the amount and like what fire stations they need to bring to Cape Creek to take care of the north part of town, the west part of town. So how do those decisions go? Those are going to be joint decisions with us and, and Dayton Mountain Fire District, but as an example, and this was told to council at the meetings, if you watch the meetings, um, as an example, Daisy Mountain, when you saw it on the map, the 144, Daisy Mountain needs something on their east side. Cape Creek needs something on our west side. If you're part of the automatic aid system, there's no reason that we can't come to an agreement and split that station. So Cape Creek would pay for one and a half stations and end up with two. Daisy Mountain would pay for, I keep reading your number, five and pay and end up with five and a half. You know, that's, that's the advantage of doing it. And all those people will work under the same system. So that's, that would probably be the next step that we would look at is what, what we need to do for the west side and what they need to do for the east side. Because it's not going to stop growing out there. In spite of what everybody says and, you know, the visitors and everybody, it's, it's still not going to stop growing. So you can't stick your head in the sand and not address it. I've always thought it was very unfair that 60% of the people are not paying their fair share for fire coverage. I mean, that's just not being part of the uh, civilization and services. My vote vote counts and, and I've been on both sides of this and all sides of this and I agree with you 100%. If you want the protection you have to have a little skin in the game in some manner. You know, I mean, whether you pay for all of it or not or you figure out different ways, I think that people need to participate. I, I've always thought that it was not fair that 40% of the 45% of the people are carrying the load and everybody else is playing traps and rolling dice and I like to play traps. <laughs> but not in that situation. Yeah. I don't. Because in, in reality, when you think about the fire service and emergency services, what you're doing is you're betting that we don't have to come. You're, you're, but you're, you're also betting that if we do, we can get there and, and make an impact on that situation, a positive situation, or positive impact on that situation. You're betting we're not coming. You know, we're, but we're, we cost a lot to do that, unfortunately. We, because when you do call us, we have to bring the resources that we need. You know, time, time is, is, our, is what we're up against. And whether it's an EMS, whether it's a fire, time is a big deal. When there's an emergency, let's say my husband fell, um, do they send the fire truck? Do yes. they have a smaller one? No. Because they have a hard time getting up my hill. Well, again, we'll look at that as it goes forward. Initially, you're going to get a fire truck because 
That, well, it's considered it almost like a Swiss Army knife. Those guys and gals are coming with everything they need. And if your husband fell and he's not hurt, then they're going to help your husband get up and put him back in the chair and bed. And then they don't know that when they're leaving your place, they're not going to go to a house fire. They don't know that they're not going to go to a level one trauma car accident on Carefree Highway. You, you, we don't know that. We're not. <laughs> you have to be prepared for whatever comes next. So you take everything you have with you because you're not dispatched every single time from the fire station. A lot of people think that. You're not. These guys are in the area, they're doing area organization, they're doing inspections, they're doing stuff. So they're not always coming from the fire station. So they have to take everything that they have with them. But that's all figured into the service level. And there is options, you know, side down the road. You could do a brush truck, for example. If you're a brush truck out doing some inspections and your husband was a he could be they could be dispatched if they were the closest unit. They would probably be backed up by an engine You have a question? Yeah, what impact would it have that we didn't pay the state for the services that they provided the fire? Uh, currently, no. The state aid that for last year. Um, so and they're happy about it and they'll come again the next one? They are happy that the town is looking to become a player. And that's what they've asked us what are you doing? And the town has given them several letters. And they have um, agreed to an intergovernmental agreement with us. We work with them to establish an ID number and an intergovernmental agreement. So they have adopted that. If you have an intergovernmental agreement with them, they're going to expect you to handle the normal stuff. But if it's the big stuff, then that's what the governor puts $8 million into the first quarter of the And so we have those agreements with the state. Yeah. You spoke of a push uh, truck coming up possibly as an ambulance. Would that be part of the new package of the fire department? That's all part of the fire department grows. Okay, you know, Would I just start out with one though. That's my question. Well, we, we can. That's uh, again going to be a decision by the council. We have right. we have it in again. The but the current budget that was approved has a brush truck in year two. Okay. Okay, we're in year one now. We don't have an engine yet. <laughs> okay. But the, the budgets that were presented to the council has a brush truck in year two, which is July of next year. Okay, so you have, you can do it now if you want. If you want to go order one and they want to order a brush truck, you could order one. But it takes a while to get that stuff built. But we're not going to do a lot of that stuff until we have our contract. You know, you got to get a fire station, you got to get a contract with, with the provider, you got to set up your dispatch with some basic stuff we have to do first. Um, because some of the stuff we'll ask for from the region. We're not going to lean on it too much. We have to be able to provide our own. But if we need a brush truck, we can ask for a brush truck. That's what we need to do. At least initially. But the town will end up, and what I told the town was, you're going to end up either with a brush truck or a tender or both. I mean, you're going to need those additional resources initially. In this package, it's also proposed that we propose that we have one Sure. Is there any community education involved in that so that people understand what they should be doing certain kinds of equipment that they should have that are developing? Well, the, the question is how much outreach are we going to be doing? We're trying to do a ton of outreach. If you've been in the town for any length of time, you should have seen a whole bunch of articles in the paper. You know, from us, even from our metro, you saw some articles. But you see the signs that are coming into town now, but don't drag, don't, don't cut. If you're going to do any of that stuff, you need to pull a permit. Like the actually in the building department, you have to have an inspection of the site before you cut or weld, especially during times of high fire danger. We're doing a lot of outreach. This is the fourth event of this, and I've done two HOA meetings. So if any of you are in an HOA and you want me to come and talk to your HOA, I'll be happy to do that too. We're doing that outreach. I would expect there to be a ton more outreach if we're going to go to a vote or not. That's, again, that decision has to be made. But, you know, community meetings and, and neighborhood meetings, all that has to happen because, and I don't know, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything about the past, but I don't know if that happened the last time. I don't know what happened with community outreach last time when it was voted on it, other than somebody just saying, vote on it and the town looked at it. I don't think that it was any outreach to say, this is why, this is what you're getting. Yes, everybody should participate or not participate. If you don't, 
you know, you know, and the, the majority is going to have to rule on that stuff. So again, that has to happen. It absolutely has to happen. Um, so to your point, we're going to continue to do that. Um, you're getting the notices from uh, Kelly. You know, we send out quarterly notices now. The last quarterly notice you did. Okay, you can go go to our website. Go to the Cave Creek Town website and let Kelly know, and we'll put you on that list. We don't have a problem sending anything out. Just like I said earlier, if there's anything here or anything I talked about that you want to know, we'll send it to you. We don't care. Okay, and if there's anybody that you talk to says, hey, I don't understand that, let us know and we'll send it to you. It's, it's all public. It's like I said, that's why I put those meetings up there. You can go look at them. Go look at them. Okay, I've kept you guys here a long time. More questions? Final questions? Okay, now you can ask questions. <laughs> Are you smoking? Am I smoking? Here. No, that's just that's my that's big no. nose. You know, kind of doesn't look like a cigar. I smoke. Uh, I don't need to start. I'm sorry, question. Um, I'm trying to remember because the, the, she said it doesn't like he has a big cigar in his mouth. Uh, oh, right. Uh, so, you know, this year I've noticed there's a lot less. Uh, Low gamma meals around here in Cape Creek. Does that have to do with any fire prevention efforts? Brain. Look, no, no brain. Well, a couple of reasons. The question is, they're noticing less low gamma meal this year than last year. Okay, we're always going to have a fire season or a desert. Okay, if you have a lot of rain in the spring, then you have a lot more low gamma meal and a lot more flash fuel that grow. We didn't have that much rain in the spring, so they didn't get water and it didn't come back again. The second thing, the reason that you're not seeing as much. We've been doing an awful lot of outreach and telling them to clean this up, establish defensible spaces, take these invasive plants off your properties, and people have been doing it. We held, we hosted two events from the town, one on February 20th, and one on March 20th, that if you cleaned up your property, you could bring all that stuff to the water campus, and the town will take it and then dump it for you. We did that in February and March, and that's where most of that, a lot of that will came all went away. But there's two reasons. One, it didn't grow like it did last year as fast. And two is the people have been paying attention to what we've been sending out. At least that's my, my impression, my theory. And the Holland Center in Fit in March, I think it's March 17th, is going to have a landscape architect here talking about how to uh, landscape and be fire safe. Well, that's never been uh, It's the second Monday in March. Glenn Perringer is going to be here, and he's a local landscaper, and he knows the area and um, how to still have a beautiful Cape Creeky yard, but still have lots of uh, wonderful animal habitat and, and so forth. But pre-emergent in the fall is the way to go. If you put down, it stops the germinating seeds. Question. I'm on a large parcel, okay. larger than five acres. Okay. And, and I had an arborist come out to take a look because we, I'm working with all of the distinct, I call it. Okay, yeah. I don't want to be kind. I want to be kind of uh, a little camera. And so, <laughs> what I, when he came out, he recommended to burn it. No, which scared the heck out of me. But no. then I pondered it a little no. because it is all very dry right now. But if if we do get a fire, no, I way. understand. I mean, a fire yeah. that could help walk with you to exterminate as you're doing that. I'm throwing that back at you just to get an answer. Uh, no, because you would have to pull a burn permit, and we're not going to issue a burn permit okay. to, to do your blow cam mill. Second is. Um, I can't even tell you the number of controlled fires that turned into non-controlled <laughs> fires because they're doing that. You're better off just knocking it down, raking it, and removing it. We're not going to give you permits. Um, what we heard from the McDowell Mountains in Scottsdale was bring in the goats. <laughs> 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 they initially asked me the Scottsdale Preserve said, we're going to burn this. And, I'm like, no, you're not. And, like, the goats and, yeah, and we didn't even want to bring in the goats. But, Yes, no, is. that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. No, you're not going to get a burn permit to do that. When the town, correct me if I'm wrong. I no, you, I <laughs> you I will be signing off on the <laughs> no, That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. And there's some major, major, if you want to look it up, go to 
um, control burns, or out of control control burns, and you'll see there's a whole list of them in the Western U.S. that, that got away. So we don't we don't do that at all in the valley, anywhere that I know of. So in the valley, a controlled fire was an oxymoron. Anywhere a controlled fire is an oxymoron, unless you're in a campfire at a Boy Scout camp or something. Other than that, there's no such thing. There's no controlled fire in a house. There's no controlled fire in a wildland. We call it under control after a certain amount of time, and we're sure it's not going to continue. The span, if it's not in control, up as a control fire. At least that's, as a fire prevention, fire marshal guy, that's my theory. The ops guys might disagree with me. I don't know. They haven't thrown anything at me yet. But, <laughs> but no, it's, a fire is a uncontrolled event. Okay. Questions? More questions? Does it make sense, hopefully? Yeah. I'm just asking to talk to people and have them pay attention. The town website is a great resource for you. All of this stuff is on the website. All of its public records, everything is there that we've done. And uh, talk to your talk to your council and let them know that, that you're happy or not happy that you're doing something. Yeah, so then what what can we do to help get the word out? Can we help people go to the website, talk to the council members. Um, that's yeah, the, the question is, what can you do to help get the word out? Talk to your neighbors, talk to your family. Um, go to the website. It's all this stuff. If you want to sit through some of that stuff, if you have a, like I mentioned earlier, if you have a neighborhood group that has five or ten people and you want to come over and talk, I'll come over and talk to you about it. Watch the council meetings because that's where the decisions are going to be made. Um, then it's all going to be, it's all going to be open record. But the biggest challenge, and I think that you brought it up, the biggest challenge is the outreach. How can you know, everybody's happy with their own little piece of paradise, their own slice of paradise. Well, this is something that's bigger than that. You know, one of the primary um, responsibilities of a town or a community is public safety. That should be somewhere near the top, at least in my mind. I don't want to... Yeah. I'm Kelly Francis. I'm the digital communication specialist. And the town of Cape Creek recently produced a newsletter that has a lot of fire safety awareness tidbits in it, which is really helpful. And all the presentations that Chief Ford described earlier that he's had this year have been bookmarked on the homepage of the website, including this conversation as well, and it will be loaded there. So if anyone missed the meeting tonight, but you'd like to fill them in on how it went, you're welcome to grab one of the cards or simply forward them in. But we need your help. We need your help also. I could talk all day, and I've already obviously done it, talk all day. But it's the same with defensible space. Every little bit that you do, as residents makes it easier and more beneficial for the responders. You know, you guarantee our access in and out. Do you have the you know cut back a little bit from the road so we're not jumping the roads? If you want to save your saguaros, if you cleaned out around the base of your saguaro, so when the fire does come through, the saguaro survives, it doesn't boil. That little bit of stuff, the principal space around your house is, makes a huge difference when an event occurs. You don't have time to do it then because it's out of control. It's out of control. I did have a question about the Sonora. So there's six feet around the Sonora if there's a nurse plant that's protecting the Sonora. I mean, you got to be careful if it's a big Palo Verde, which I would do, you know, I would, you know, trim your branches up on your Palo Verde to three or four or six feet and clear the stuff out around the base of it. So then it blows through, then all you're burning is the light stuff on the top. And so you might burn that, but you're not going to boil the base of the Sonora. I, we have to do a real fire. In Scottsdale, we burned uh, about 26,000 acres, and I admit it, out there with ASU, the botanists, so they said, why did we kill all the saguaros? These things are hundreds of years old, and it's because of the fuel load at the base of the saguaro. It boils, and, and before the fires would come through really quickly, you burn the needles, and you can look and say, oh, geez, you had a fire come from this direction, and then the rest of the needles were fine. That's not what's happening now. That's why we say, even just you know three to five feet around the base of that saguaro, and you have a good chance of surviving the fire. You got another question? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thanks for. Uh keep keep people involved. Keep people involved. You know, I want to I want them educated. The town educated. Thank you again. Thank you.